Hello, everyone. I am so excited to welcome you to Foundry Live, our Foundry Education Summit. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people on the call from around the world. Uh, feel free to shout out in the chat um, where you're from. It's always nice to see how, how many countries we cover. Um, today's event is really amazing. I'm so excited. We have some fantastic speakers. Uh, we've got speakers from all over the world, actually. We've got speaker speaker from Brazil. We've got a speaker from Canada. We've got two from the States and one from the UK. So we're really excited to bring this global team together. Um, everyone's going to share a piece of their journey in terms of um, education and training and talk about their perspective. Um, so we're really excited. Uh, so housekeeping stuff, you can, we'll be chatting in the, uh, chatting in the um, chat column. And then there's also the questions uh, tab as well. Um, if you have a question for any of the speakers or for Foundry, you can place it in the question tab and we'll make sure to address it. So we're all going to walk through our presentations um, and then we'll be open for a live Q&A. Some presentations have been recorded for quality. Um, so you'll see the pre-recorded, but the speakers are all live. They're here to answer your questions. Um, and we're really just happy for you to join us today. I just wanted to say a thank you to Dell and Vidya and our friends at FXPHG. Um, they've been amazing in their support. We've been working with Dell on our series of Foundry Live events since they actually were live back in January. They've given us some great hardware and Vidya has been super supportive on the hardware as well. And we do have a special giveaway from the wonderful team at FXPHD who've offered us um, a six month license for their site so you can test out some of the new training they have to offer. So we'll be pulling that name from attendees. So if you're not on the call, you can't win. Um, and we'll be announcing that at the end of the session. So uh, I just want to talk really quickly about our Foundry virtual events. I was just telling our speakers, we've done 30, 20, no, so 24 virtual events since the end of March. Um, we've covered every topic from on Katana and Mari and Moto. Um, we've talked to VFX supervisors. We've talked to new technical directors. There's some really amazing, there's an amazing presentation um, called Foundry Skill Up. So how to go from a mid-level to a senior compositor. So I definitely would recommend they're all on that web page that this link will take you to. And I recommend taking a look. There's some excellent uh, resource for some of your classroom work. Um, so please feel free to share that content with your students. Um, we're more than happy to have you, um, you know, share share that uh, with that material. Um, so this is part one. It's day one of Foundry Live. So we're kicking off today with our fantastic community of educators and trainers. Um, and then next week we'll be going into more of the product questions and the product unveiling. So the team um, just announced last night that at our Look Dev and Lighting virtual meetup, they'll be showing some really amazing stuff with the new catastrophe a 4.0 that's coming. Um, we have a Nuke 12.2 launch. I think I saw a question fly by in the chat. This is not the uh, the session for Nuke questions. That's for next Tuesday. So make sure you sign up. All these links are available on our events page. And then of course we have a, a 3D Design Moto virtual meetup, which we're really excited about. So please join us. You can register for as many as you would like. Um, just wanted to shout out to our fantastic customers who have joined us on this virtual journey um, since we stopped doing live events at the end of March. Um, really proud, at, or mid-March I should say, really proud and excited to, um, to be working with all these companies. They've shared their stories and all this information is part of that virtual events. Um, list of list of archived presentations we have some are on YouTube as well um, but this has been an amazing time with all these great customers so thank you for anyone's out there who works with these companies and um, we really appreciate you if you want to keep up to date on what's going on with foundry we have some quarterly newsletters so depending on what your what your passion is if you're into compositing if you're into look dev and lighting or you just want to kind of get a sense of the general technology insights we post um, we've got some great content in our insights hub it's on our website and you can and you can sign up for these newsletters Elise will share the link with you um, and you can also follow us on social media we post a lot of content from our customers as well as us so there's um, many channels available to you depending on what your your favorite is oops wrong button I didn't do anything. Okay, Foundry Education, that's why you're here. Um, so our awesome education team led by Kaylin Arnold, who many of you probably know, um, and her colleague Eugenie, they've been working really hard on supporting our schools um, since a lot of the schools went into shutdown earlier this year. So if you're a Foundry customer and you need help with some of the remote access, most of you should have already worked with the team, but we're here to help you throughout the fall, throughout the end of the year, and beyond um, as we need to in terms of the remote classrooms, our team, cut a ton of licenses um, for everyone so they can put this in a remote situation. So if you need help, um, please make sure to reach out to our team. Uh, we are here to help. 
Um, we also have our first year fee program for students out there. So it's all on our website, on our education page. Um, but students have access to one year free license. And then there's a journey where they can actually upgrade to a commercial version of our software for really reasonable rates. Um, so take a look at our education pages. All the info's there. Um, Mari and Katana. So Katana is now part of the Education Collective. This has been for since last SIGGRAPH. Um, so please, if you need any, if any questions on Katana or Mari as well, it's all in there. Um, and again, we're here to help. So just reach out, use education at foundry.com. That goes to three or four people in the education team and they're very responsive. So use that and they'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, training resources. So we've been working really hard internally and externally. Um, oh, I'm missing one little bullet, I apologize, um, on some of our training resources. So we're working on some really awesome new, new Nuke training. We've got two in the pipeline, one for um, getting that first job as a student and what some of the tips and tricks and, and using Nuke in production as a, as a someone entering their first production job so that's coming soon uh, we also have some brilliant training coming on um, color space and color management from Victor Perez our VFX supervisor good friend out of um, Italy we also have some great new content from Mari and Moto so um, the Moto footwear design is just brilliant um, and then Emma on our team did the beginner's guide to texturing and Mari it's fantastic so this information is there and almost all of the learning content from Boundary comes with with, um, scene files and and what you need to actually implement the training and use it so you're welcome to use that again any questions education uh, at foundry.com um, not going to comment on the comments yet because I'll get distracted then of course we're working with all of our um, awesome community resources so Ben McEwen has a great Python for new course very inexpensive and, and very very well regarded uh, Josh Parks does some compositing pro courses. You'll hear more about Josh later on um, from Mark. And then, of course, we are working with FX PhD. And I mentioned that there was um, a, a thank you there. It's because we are giving away um, a six month license to FX PhD. So you can check out the brand new photorealism and compositing with Nuke from our friend Victor. Awesome content, um, and it's there available for you. And that's it for me, actually. That was quicker than I thought. So thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to. Um, kick this over to Mark. Um, Mark will come off mute <laughs> and he'll be here um, and we'll load up his, his presentation. Hi, my name is Mark Allman and originally I was from industry. I worked in London on the Harry Potter films, Doctor Who, in companies like The Mill, Frame Store, Double Negative and so on. And now I run the visual effects degree in the University of Hertfordshire. So we teach a range of things. Uh, we don't just have a visual effects degree. We've got a 3D animation degree, a games art degree, and a 2D degree. It's, as I said, a three year course. And the first year is a common year. So everyone tries a bit of everything. And the, the reason for that is people think they know what they want without knowing what they want. So we, we let them play and experiment with lots of different subject areas until they find the one they like. So what you saw up there were some examples of some basic 3D compositing we teach. We start from the ground up with Nuke, assuming they, their students have no knowledge. And this is some examples of gizmos and uh, Python, leading to the finished product here. So we, as well as the technical, we are, I'd say, 50-50 balanced with technical and art. We, we do push the creative side a lot. Uh, composition is quite important. Here we're looking at the, the balancing and the grading of the footage against the CG. There's also digital matte painting. That's one of the other things we do. And they start with a clean plate. There's a clean plate. And that'd be camera tracking. It would be um, basic geometry projection. So as I said, photography is a big, big part, uh, which leads to the camera work. And you can see here, a, a good compositor should know how to compose something, not just, um, Compatibility CG and they, they should be able to reframe, grade, vignette, uh, do all the sort of artistic touches and that's one of the, one of the reasons we need to use Nuke because it's so powerful. This is our digital map painting. The interesting part here uh, was the P uh, the geometry got turned to PREF and projected onto PREF. Someone, uh, Chris I think, wrote the script for that. Uh, they tend to make their films in the second year and here are some examples of films. So we do uh, green screen removal, clean plate, 
work and it, it's it's a lot of the bread and butter for a junior compositing Whoa. artist it's not always the glamorous bits but it's the bit that will get you a job <laughs> so the companies tell us and that, that's the bit they find important and quite often lacking from most student showreels they want some of the basic cleanup work in there um so like that for example the green screen uh, turns into a digital matte painting so you can see a combination of everything coming together at that point this one the best visual effects film in the rookies and uh, this was a lot of hard work they did some filming at night uh, the, the background you saw in a shot earlier was for this film so there's a team of a core team of three worked on this project one compositor but they came up with some of the concepts some of the concepts were given to them they block the previs in as well using nuke which is a, a an underrated way of using previs or uh, using nuke sorry uh quite powerful and this was their their second year film which was pretty impressive as well um there you go what a student feels in our university <laughs> so yeah it's it's a lot of again clean plate removal all these kind of the, the bread and butter basics which lead into a 3d set so how to blend live action into a 3D set. It took a lot of to and fro with this team and they did a really, really good job. And they had to write their own tools for a lot of this to work. Um, I guess that's how they felt when they made the project, they're the team. Um, so yeah, we provide the cameras and they go off onto sets. Um, we also obviously get industry people to come and help uh, with visiting lecturing as well. So we've got a lot of people coming to help us on Wednesdays. So what is the secret sauce to our success? Well, we, we don't just teach compositing, as I mentioned before, we teach a whole variety of things. We really, really push the soft skills. And by that, I mean the uh, being professional, networking, um, promoting yourself, being on the social media side of things. Uh, and where, where does that lead you? Well, here are some examples of some graduated students. Chris Fry, he uh, graduated fairly recently. Uh, he's worked in ILM and a range of other companies and you can see he uh, now does his own uh, bits of training there, he's got a blog. Uh, Josh Parks is another very successful person. He uh, is currently, currently in PC advertising but he's worked at ILM and other places as well. He's got, uh, probably if, if you're very into Nuke, he does a newsletter uh, and I know that's quite popular in the industry. Uh, it does updates and things in the newsletter. So people like Josh and Chris feed back into our course. So how do they do that? Well, everything I plan for the next year or the year ahead or two years ahead or three years ahead, I um, send out ideas to industry. I send out ideas to compositors. I try and get a, a, a feeling of where the industry is moving. So everything I do, I send back to my students in the industry and then they feed back to me. So Mark, you know, this, that's not a great idea doing this. How about this? This is a new big thing. And so I, I think that's part of our secret that we've got such strong connections with our graduates that they, they help build us into the course we are, which just makes us get better and better and better. Thank you so much, Mark, for putting that presentation together. Um, and I think uh, I think it, we deserve a, a call out to um, to your school because didn't you get some news last night from uh, from an organization that some of us know quite well? Yes, actually, I did. Yes, um, so we won multiple prizes at the rookies. Um, off the top of my head, without cross checking, I can't remember which ones they are now. But we did, yeah, we won three prizes. I think best film, um, show reel, and one of the prizes, uh, amazingly, was from uh, some of my second year students as well, which was absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah. So, um, uh, film of the year, uh, uh, people's choice, and we also won game of the year. We do a games degree as well, as I said in the presentation. Congratulations. Yeah, really, really proud of my students.
Excellent. For those of you not familiar with the rookies, we will. Oh, look, Martin Bowman helped you on the uh, yeah. on the chat. Um, <laughs> for those who aren't used to, who aren't familiar with the rookies, we'll send you um, a link. But thank you for continuing all your awesome Nuke education, your VFX education, and we appreciate you so much. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you. If anyone has any questions for Mark, please put it in the questions tab, and we'll address it during the Q and A. And we're going to move over now to Kevin. Thanks, Jen. And uh, yeah, great stuff, Mark. It's always good to see what the University of Hertfordshire are doing, uh, especially as we're validated by them. Um, so I'll try not to talk about any of the things that you discussed, because like we said, um, you know, we, we do pretty much mimic everything that UH uh, do. And that's why we obviously decided to be validated by them. Uh, amazing university platform and amazing student work. Um, super cool stuff. So I'm going to talk a little bit about global education standards and uh, a new term that I've coined called pipeline pedagogy. Um, so welcome everyone, I'm Kevin, I'm a Dean of Faculty at Scholar Britannica Giats Clear Achievers in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, my background is kind of a strange, I, I kind of came into education very late, I don't have any GCSEs, no A-levels, and I kind of decided to go um, into education after already learning Nuke and Houdini and a few things. Um, and then that led for me uh, being employed by the university I was studying at, Sheffield Hallam, uh, to teach Nuke, got hooked on education, and 10 years later now I'm a Dean and a principal lecture, et cetera. But my favorite thing to do with education is curriculum design. I design awesome courses. I've built a bunch when I was in my last university, Bradford. Um, and since being in Brazil and uh, working at EBAC, I've made a whole heap of courses, of a bunch of all different ranges. Um, Brazil, it's an amazing place, super creative, amazing studios, amazing people. Um, and the industry is booming here. If you were to throw a stone, from uh, our university, you'd hit a production company. Um, this is Jonas Almeida's VFX World Maps. You check it out. Um, really good stuff. So this is our school, our university. Um, as we said before, we're validated by the University of Hertfordshire. We teach a whole bunch of courses from CPD um, to uh, undergraduate courses, preparatory courses, um, and go through the full range of games, animation, visual effects, art and design. So amazing stuff there and a great location uh, and great teachers. What we really try and push is our industry standards. Just as Mark does a lot of stakeholder feedback on his courses, so do we. We have to do it a little bit differently though because everything we do is for Brazil primarily and globally. Um, so yeah, we do teach the full suite of uh, the Foundry's products, for example, and loads of other uh, awesome bits of software. We also teach entrepreneurship, pipeline, uh, business, marketing, um, you know, and everything we do is a fusion of science and art mixed together. Um, I'll talk about one of my courses I developed. So this was a, a program I designed uh, to help with students' um, entry into undergraduate courses, the year zero in computer graphics and film production. So it was designed by my academic consulting company, ProGamma, uh, specifically for EBAC and the needs of the Brazilian market. What this is, is a new teaching and me uh, learning methodology called pipeline pedagogy that simulates a studio for one year, where the students work on one project um, with myself kind of acting like a client, if you will, uh, at the center. So rather than being a teacher, it's more that I'm, uh, you know, really busting them and, and making them do things just like a client would. So they go through the whole range of all the software and uh, Foundry software is kind of the glue for this, you know, especially um, through the, the research design and the conceive and produce phase, um, you know, things like, um, Mari and Katana and Flix specifically has helped to bring the 2D students and the uh, concept artists really together in the project management with all the 3D and the CG guys. You know, um, and so we're really super um, grateful for the support from the Foundry, um, all their initiatives, they're doing amazing stuff. And on the right, you can see kind of what the students are saying about this software, you know, how it's actually helping them um, to work. Um, and in respect to our students, and this is the kind of level we are getting our students to based off of these educational provisions. This guy on the right uh, with the tablet is safe. Uh, he actually works now for my consulting company, ProGamut. Um, and this year we sent him, he's in his final year, so level six, uh, he's just going to graduate this the end of this year. We sent him to, uh, my company sent him to Hype Studios, which is in Porto Alegre. Um, you can go to their site, hype.cg. Um, and what we did, our consultant company, we helped them with their Katana Studio Pipeline. So not only is this guy not even finished university yet, he's already going into studios and setting up pipelines and teaching them all the tools. Um, and they've used that in uh, Rovio's uh, Angry Birds, that uh, was their latest project. So. Some amazing stuff, but we need to do more. We need to keep educating and, and try and make things a bit more um, free 
in respects to education and who uh, can access it. So that's why I'm very, very proud to announce that today uh, is actually also the launch day for uh, my new uh, online platform, Institution X, the Institute for Gifted Mutants. Um, this platform is both web and app, full learning management system, uh, but the best thing is we're giving all the education to free for those who need it. So if people can't afford, they get everything for free. There's no, no charging at all. Um, so, yeah, please jump on there. Have a look. Um, sign up. You know, our first course that we've just released today, a 20 uh, lesson course, again, created by another one of my students, Jonas Ruiz. Uh, it's a free introduction to the Foundry's new Kex, uh, really in depth. Um, and there's going to be plenty more to come from loads of world class people all teaching a lot of the foundry's tools. So, again, trying to open up education to the world is hard, especially when you're in a place like Brazil where there's a lot of inequality. So, um, you know, ourselves at EBAC, we try our hardest to, to give as many scholarships and do as many things as we can. Um, but, you know, that's why I've built Institution X so that we can absolutely give everything for free. Um, and I've managed to do this talk in record time. So thank you very much. Cheers to everyone. Go check out EBAC, uh, Institution X. Thank you from the Foundry. Um, and I think I've got enough time to show uh, what um, Hype Studios were uh, doing with their, their work. So if uh, you want to roll the, the video of what they've been doing with uh, Angry Birds, that'd be amazing. Hi, guys. My name is Marcos Moraes. I work at the Luke Devon Lightning Department at Hype. We are in a small studio in Brazil. We work together with another two studios, Punk Robot from Chile and Red Animation from Peru, in a new Angry Birds project for Rovio. And we used Catan in our pipeline for the first time. It was a great experience because we could achieve great results, speeding our process in the look dev and render once any episode brings a new environment. So new textures, new lights and mood. We choose set the mood for each episode in Nook so Katana allows us to set the render passes in a way that works very well for us and we are very happy with uh, what we could achieve. We use it for example just one material for all the environments and props just changing the textures without, uh, without need to create a new material every time. We could, uh, we could adjust the passes in a custom way in some cases and that works well for the post-processing. We also used less space in our server because the Katana files are very light. We also used 3D lighting Katana for the first time for lightning and render and it was a simple and great experience. And that's it. Thank you guys. Super cool stuff coming out of some of these studios. Um, they just need the tools and the education. Kevin, thank you so much for sharing um, your story. And I think, you know, what really resonates with me is the um, the accessibility that you're working to offer. I think that's really important. Um, globally and uh, we have a few other speakers who will be addressing accessibility um, and inclusion. So thank you for that. That's super important. You're welcome. Um, and what great work you guys are doing and how fun to work on work with studios like Hype who we love. So thank you. And thank you Brazil for all your awesome artists and work in there. <laughs> yeah, amazing place. Check it out. Cheers. Awesome. Well, I'm really happy to uh, introduce Giuseppe Improda. Uh, Giuseppe lives where I used to live in Vancouver, Canada, um, and he's here to talk today about his vision for lighting. With that, Giuseppe, I'll pass it to you and I will go off stage. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Amazing work from both you, Mark and Kevin. Uh, really important to share education in those places where, uh, you know, there are no uh, resources for that. Um, I have uh, been uh, working in the industry for about 20 years now. I started in Italy as a generalist, as many uh, of the people that start in Italy. Um, did not have the means to have uh, an expensive school in my portfolio. So uh, I really appreciate when somebody pushes education where uh, people don't have the um, the resources for it. So today I just want to share quickly uh, what I do when I teach lighting um, as a first part of the course, because I think some of these things are not taught very much. And 
um, it's something that really makes a difference between an artist that can push buttons and somebody that can actually read and elaborate an image. Uh, so visual culture for lighting, what does this mean? Uh, basically means giving the artist the tools to actually think with their own head, even before going to the software. Uh, so we have a situation now where the technology uh, boundaries are really, really getting smaller for lighters. We can do interactive uh, rendering pretty much uh, real time. Uh, we have new technologies like virtual productions where we can mix uh, virtual words with game engines and ray tracing and all these amazing technologies and have that run real time on set. So um, the technological limitations are definitely getting smaller and smaller. And we can have a creative flow when we create lighting um, tool, lighting shots. Uh, so for me, the baseline of uh, 3D lighters has to be uh, traditional, uh, uh, a little bit of traditional and uh, academic knowledge. So art history, drawing, painting, photography, and cinematography uh, should be, I believe, uh, the base uh, matters that we study when we teach lighting. Uh, I'll go quickly through each of them to explain why I think that. Um, so uh, art history gives the knowledge of the tools from the past to today, uh, teaches us the innovation that has been done through the years. And also learning about the masters of art history is really important because that creates a sort of a reference database for uh, an artist to look to. Um, these things are really important for the development of the artist itself because himself because um, you want to have a knowledge of what has changed across the years in order to also innovate and predict what is going to happen in the future and it's really important to uh, have a solid foundation with uh, uh, art history and understanding how things have evolved um, drawing and painting are really important because they are not just, um, you know, like interacting with the screen. They involve other, uh, all uh, uh, our senses. So with the uh, drawing, uh, the student can learn about volumes, about the forms, about uh, uh, what is really important to look at. And uh, uh, with the painting, you can learn uh, about mixing colors and, uh, uh, you know, like having that specific tone. And it's a very different thing than actually picking the color, the millions of colors that we have available in our color pickers, in our softwares. It's a very different experience. It stick uh, to your brain a lot faster and a lot better. And then finally, you can learn chiaroscuro, which is basically being able to read an image through contrast and light. Uh, so just relying on the values. A lot of problems I have uh, with young lighters is that they don't understand contrast. And uh, obviously, there are situation today where uh, we also have HDR technologies where we want to manage the exposure really, really well, which brings me to the next topic, which is photography. Um, we have to deal when we work in production with the character lighting and we a lot of times we have a lot of different shots. So uh, learning really about photography gives you that knowledge to understand what lighting works best for that specific character based on uh, his anatomy, for example. So learning how to do portrait traits, learning how to do full body uh, to emphasize the character even when it's very small in the picture um, and as well as uh, doing group photography. So when we have to do crowd lighting, you actually have the knowledge of uh, how uh, to set the lights properly compared to a real world scenario. Um, and then finally, we have cinematography that basically brings all of these to the next level, which is adding the motion, adding the movement. Uh, so we want to learn uh, how cameras move and uh, uh, why it's important to complement that movement with the right lighting, with the right mood. How lights work, a lot of mistakes are done, I see, uh, by young lighters that just place lights wherever they can because we rely on uh, CG tools that allow us a lot of flexibility like light blinking or we are able to hide lights and then we have lights that are very close to characters and are very big and they don't really look at all that good. Um, and that's usually uh, some Something that comes from the fact that not many people have on-set experience. Uh, I've been lucky enough in Italy to work on set as a cinematographer for a few years and also as a photographer for many years. And so this kind of experience it really uh, gives uh, the hedge uh, to the lighters that understand these things. Uh, and then finally, understanding the look 
and the grading. What can we do to make that a specific shot more cinematic? What can what tools can we use? Uh, atmospheric effects, but also uh, color casting, like defining the right palette for that shot. And a lot of these things are also um, managed by the creative department. Sometimes, if you work in a bigger production, but that doesn't mean that as an artist you shouldn't know about all these things. So now uh, in today's DCC world, we have visual effects matching, like free uh, visual effects sequences. Unlike the past, now we have the freedom of creating uh, full visual effects shots from scratch, sequences from scratch. So that means that somebody has to have the creative knowledge to do that. Um, and then we have animated feature films, games, and virtual productions. And all these things together are um, basically uh, all using the same uh, concept that I have talked about before. So all uh, these uh, knowledge can be shared across multiple um, fields of this industry. That's why I really believe that lighting on its own should be considered a discipline and studied uh, with a specific course. Um, then we have the 3D technical uh, uh, requirements for lighting. Um, so we have uh, to manage a lot of data. Things are becoming more complex by the day. Um, and even though real-time technologies are catching up for simpler things, we still have tons of layers to manage. We have to gather uh, data from all the departments. And then we have to make sure that our light rigs uh, are working for all the artists. So that means being able uh, to share, um, you know, uh, like in a more objective way what we create. And then we have to optimize render times, split the render into passes, and then composite the final shot. Um, and obviously, this takes advantage of all the things that we have studied before. Uh, now, all these technicalities are, um, in this time and age, though a byproduct of just rendering the image. While in the past, we had to do a lot of tricks to light the shot, a fake bounce light, fake a lot of different aspects of the uh, final image. Today, we can just place lights, and more or less, you know, the lights behave uh, realistically. And so that means that we have a lot more freedom as 3D lighters to create a shot and get to the uh, final product. And uh, now to manage these uh, technical things, I prefer to use Katana. Personally, it's my favorite lighting and look dev software for three main reasons, because it's scalable. So, um, you know, you can have a lot of stuff in there, a lot of data without uh, uh, having the interface to slow down all that much. So that's unheard of. And then uh, it's intuitive, because now we have a node-based interface where everybody can actually trace back and debug uh, what's happening in the scene unlike other softwares where you know things happen in the background and then somebody has to guess uh, what was uh, done in order to debug the shot uh, so students should learn this tool uh, also to understand what are the steps and the process that goes into lighting a shot and then finally it's customizable so um, essentially we can uh, adjust it to the shot, to the sequence, and make it really work for us and to adjust, adjust it to the different levels of knowledge of each, the, of each uh, uh, artist. So junior artists can still use all our tools uh, seamlessly because we can customize it very, very much. So in summary, what I really promote when I teach lighting and look dev is that we want to have artists that can think, that have a visual imaging culture, that don't just push buttons. Uh, we want to have the past and uh, uh, as our reference book, you know, like uh, knowing what a style is, what, what is uh, like a different uh, way of creating an image. Sometimes in production, you work on different kind of styles and not many people can actually face that kind of challenge to get into that style quickly. Uh, because maybe uh, we teach a lot of like standard things, but not an, enough of uh, uh, very particular stylized looks. Um, then learning the side technique side of things means that when there is a problem we solve it it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to learn the technical side of things ahead of time before we can even think and then finally I always emphasize to all our students that the best software is uh, still our brain and so we have to have that uh, knowledge in our brain to then take advantage of the best parts of our software so that's how I see it I hope this was uh, uh, useful and uh, thanks very much to everybody for listening I love that, Giuseppe, that the best software is in your brain. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that's, that's amazing. And I love looking back to some of the uh, 
some of the original artists from hundreds of years ago um, with the art history. I think that's wonderful um, and important, I think. Um, as a mom, I know that <laughs> the young ones today don't always know about the masters and uh, the classics that are out there. Uh, with that, um, the, our next speaker is going to talk um, about his the post-production program that he runs. Um, Ryan is based in New York and works for a wonderful organization, and I won't steal any of his thunder, so what I'll do is I'll just switch it over to Ryan and uh, mute myself. If anyone has any questions for Giuseppe, please put them either in, put them in the questions tab or feel free to post comments in the chat as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Penny. I'm the director of the Made in New York Post-Production Training Program, which is a completely free nonprofit job training program for low-income New Yorkers, uh, low-income and unemployed New Yorkers. Uh, we were created in partnership between the nonprofit that I work for, uh, which I'll mention in a minute, uh, and the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, as well as the Department of Small Business Services for New York City. Um, so as I mentioned, the, uh, the nonprofit that I work for is called Brooklyn Workforce Innovations. We are a nonprofit workforce development organization uh, that does different job training programs for different industries that are promising for the New York City economy. Um, so we have eight training programs across woodworking, uh, commercial truck driving, network cable and installation, as well as the two Made in New York production careers training programs, um, which I am one of. Um, so the Made in New York programs, uh, the first one is the production assistant training program that was started in 2006, kind of our big sister in a lot of ways. Um, they are training folks to work on set as production assistants um, on large-scale New York City productions. Uh, we were launched in 2017 when they identified post-production as an area that was growing uh, in New York City's industry. So, um, so like I said, the, the, the tax credits were a big part of that. New York State has a robust tax credit program for both production, but also VFX and animation. And a lot of uh, companies are bringing their work to New York State um, to work on projects there and need the help. And so that's what we're here for. Um, so we provide training, access, and support to these industries. And um, as I'll mention more about in a minute, you know, we are also uh, part of our mission is to provide diversity to an industry that is largely white and largely male. So um, that's another thing that we're working on as well. So who are our trainees? So we are 21 and over. Um, our trainees all have a desire to specifically work in post-production and or VFX. Um, and they, we we flesh that out by uh, requiring them to have at least six months of production experience. So either, you know, maybe they've taken their first steps as working as a production assistant on set, or they've worked in an office or uh, at a media company or some in some capacity where they understand where post-production and VFX fit into the production pipeline and know that they want to move in that direction and know that they need to learn more about some of the technical software and skills that they'll need to be able to succeed in those parts of the industry. So we do also look for folks to have a baseline understanding and, and strong computer skills because we do know that we're throwing a lot at them during the course uh, in terms of software training. And, uh, and so we look for those skills on the front end as well. They do have to be New York City residents uh, currently residing in New York City for at least six months by the time that they register for our program. Um, most of them, it's important to note, have not worked in Nuke before they come to us. Um, but, you know, we find that, and, and that's something that I had in common with them when I came on to launch the course uh, as the founding director. I was a video editor and was working with Avid and, and doing TV shows, and um, I hadn't I had heard of Nuke. I had opened it up on my computer but didn't have a lot of experience, um, and I was a little bit nervous about uh, getting folks up to speed on Nuke in just a few sessions. But in a lot of ways, our trainees are able to pick up on the software more quickly than and someone like myself who had some After Effects experience and, um, you know, and hadn't really worked with Nuke very much. But I'm amazed at how they're able to pick it up uh, when we get them into the course. So as I was mentioning before, um, the demographics of our trainees, 96% are people of color. 50% uh, of our trainees identify as women or non-binary, gender non-conforming. Uh, and 58% have not earned a bachelor's degree. 
Part of who we look for to train are folks that have not had the opportunity to go to a four-year, uh, get a four-year education and are really looking to start a career and learn from the ground up. And so uh, we try to focus on giving them the tools that they need to be able to get that very first opportunity. Uh, and that might be in something like a client services role at a facility, um, but we also teach them that those kinds of roles are a great opportunity to meet everyone, to build relationships, and to learn more about the parts of the industry that they want to climb into uh, as they progress in their careers. So um, what we offer our trainees during our course is five weeks of, of training. Uh, it's very intensive, five weeks of full-time training where we are doing a lot of that technical training in the software that I mentioned. Um, the, the actual software is Avid, Premiere, Photoshop, After Effects, and Nuke in a five-week course, which is quite a lot, as you can imagine. But again, uh, we're really looking to give people an introduction to each one of those softwares and allow them to let us know where their interests are so that we can try to position them in the parts of the industry where they're most likely to succeed. And really having a rapid fire of each one of those pieces of software during the five weeks allows us to see that and allows us to work with them to identify where those uh, where those parts of the industry are so that we can position them for that success. Um, during our course, we try to bring in as many guest speakers and industry connections uh, as we can to introduce our trainees to other aspects of the industry that they may not even be familiar with. You know, a lot of folks come into our program thinking that they want to be an editor because they've heard of post-production and they know that videos and films need to be edited. Um, but then when they come to us and they find out about color correction and they find out about visual effects and they find out about producing and all sorts of different aspects, um, they get really excited and inspired to build careers in those specific parts of the industry. Um, normally, we are trying to take as many field trips and, uh, and go to museums and post-production facilities and VFX facilities as possible. Obviously, uh, right now, we're doing all of that virtually and our training virtually with, uh, we're currently in, right smack in the middle of one of our cycles, um, but it's going quite well. Uh, thank goodness for all of these remote training tools and, and uh, connection tools. Um, and then, so once folks graduate from our course, they complete the five weeks, they, they uh, have learned all of those different software, we continue a relationship with them where we give them two years of career support coaching uh, and access to things like FX PhD for anyone that is interested in VFX. We have a partnership with FX PhD that allows us to uh, support licenses for those folks to be able to continue their learning after they're with us. So uh, we're really trying to make sure that they get their first opportunity, uh, connected with their first opportunity as quickly as possible because they do come from that low income or unemployment background. We're trying to find those kinds of opportunities as quickly as possible, but then also trying to support them to be able to use the experience that they're gaining in a position like that to get to the next level and then hopefully build an entire career where they get to stay in the industry. Um, the, we work with a number of different employers in New York City, uh, and what we offer them is really a curated pipeline of quality diverse pros for both post and VFX. Um, so we, at the entry level point, I should specify. Um, but you know, we are trying to line up the kinds of opportunities that are coming into us with the specific trainees that have the most likelihood of succeeding and uh, wanting to do a great job in that position. So um, we again use that that software training and the relationship that we build with our trainees over the five weeks to be able to work with employers and make sure that we're giving them our top three candidates at any given time so that they're not wasting a bunch of time with their hiring processes and we're making sure to, to highlight the best people for them at that given time. Um, so our hires are familiar with the industry standard software, but they're also getting a lot of instruction about um, general general industry norms and you know the politics of working in facilities and how they can build relationships with their coworkers and learn from them and allow them to uh, establish relationships and potentially mentoring relationships that can stick with them for years to come. Um, we also are able to offer a wage reimbursement for eligible employers in New York City that are able to hire our trainees. That is through our uh, partnership with the New York City Department of Small Business Services, uh, where we're able to support that. Um, these are just some of the companies that 
uh, have offices in New York City that we have been working with. You see Technicolor, you see Company 3, Picture Farm, Zoic, the Artery, Sim, Nice Shoes, The Molecule, et cetera. This is just a sampling. Uh, but many of these folks are, are working in entry level, either client services, production assistant roles for post or for VFX or uh, are you know, junior compositors working on learning the things that they need to be learning to be able to uh, become a full-time employee or at least a regular freelancer. Uh, and then these are some of the films and TV shows that our trainees have been working on over the last three years uh, in either post-PA roles, VFX PA roles, VFX coordinator roles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of quickly highlight a couple of uh, individual trainee success stories. So Corey was a, 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 an individual that came to us without any knowledge of Nuke whatsoever. Um, he learned Nuke for the, the classes that we offered and was able to, shortly after he finished training, connect with an opportunity to work at Zoic in New York City, um, where he was doing a kind of hybrid role, where he was doing a little bit of client services, but also learning compositing. And uh, we were able to work with them for our work-based learning program and provide the wage reimbursement that allowed them to keep a portion of, of Corey's day for learning compositing. And after the seven week period that the wage reimbursement covered, Corey was up to speed enough that he was able to start some basic rotoscoping and do some before and after videos for them and was able to continue working with Zoic. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic shutdown occurred. Uh, and so he's not currently with them, but, um, but he's looking forward to getting back as soon as possible. He's been uh, compositing and practicing Etc. on his own. So, uh, and then just one other success story. We have Luis Irala, who is uh, just finished up a gig working as a VFX coordinator for uh, Project Power, I believe the name of the project is. Um, but before that, was working as VFX coordinator for Spike Lee's The Five Bloods. Uh, Luis has started out as a VFX PA with Stargate Studios and was able to uh, get trained up enough to be able to become and stick with that team when they moved on to do the Spike Lee project. So um, just a short time after she finished, graduated from the course, she was able to connect with those kinds of opportunities and is well off to a, a, a hopefully a long career in VFX. Um, and then one other aspect of my personal role um, is that I am currently the co-chair of the New York City chapter of a group called Access VFX. Um, which is an organization based out of the United Kingdom that is pursuing inclusion, diversity, and awareness uh, and opportunity within the VFX animation and games industries globally. Um, so we, as I mentioned, they started in the UK, but there are now chapters in NYC, Montreal, Chicago, and the West Coast. Um, and we are, as an organization, partnering with the Foundry to provide an innovative e-mentoring platform that allows interested people all over the world to connect with a mentor anywhere else in the world through the Slack platform. So if anyone's familiar with the Slack communication tool, uh, it's a great way that you can send messages. Uh, it's a monitored program, so it's uh, monitored by, by a group called Prospella. And uh, we can make sure that anyone who's a student is able to pair up with a mentor anywhere in the world who has experience and can share that with that student. So um, you can find out more information about Access VFX at the accessvfx.org website, um, and, or you can ask me if you're interested in any other aspects of it. Um, and then just finally, I just wanted to leave my contact information if anyone's interested in connecting with me directly to discuss our course for Access VFX or anything uh, New York City related, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to have a chat about what you are doing anywhere in the world. So thank you Foundry for the opportunity to be able to uh, speak today. And I look forward to continuing to work with, uh, with trainees that are interested in VFX and help them find their very first opportunities and then help support them as they build careers in both VFX and post-production more generally. So thank you, Jen, and thank you to the Foundry team. Thank you, Ryan. Um, that's It's such an awesome program. Uh, and I think, uh, here's everybody's favorite. <laughs> I think as, um, you know, if you're, if you're hearing the themes, and, and one of the themes that we tried to use to tie in all of our speakers together was, how are the different schools and how are the different educators working with studios and facilities um, in order to build awareness of their programs and their students, um, which is a, a fantastic segue to our final speaker today. Um, 
we have Danielle here with us from Lucasfilm, uh, and she's going to talk a little bit about the programs that ILM and Lucasfilm have um, for graduates. And just for housekeeping again, as soon as Danielle's finished, we'll do some open Q&A, so keep those questions coming in the questions tab. We're trying to answer the direct ones about specific things, but keep them coming if you have any questions for the panelists. So with that, Danielle, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. And uh, I just want to say thank you for including me in this panel. It's been really interesting and uh, inspiring to hear um, from um, folks around the world about what they're doing uh, in terms of education and visual effects. That's definitely my passion. Um, I'm the director of talent development at Lucasfilm and ILM. I started as a training coordinator. Thank you very much. Many, many years ago and have kind of always stayed in the education and training space. Um, so at Lucasfilm and ILM, we're all about timeless stories and innovative storytelling. And we are also home to surprise the child, AKA baby Yoda. So, you know, everybody needs a little baby Yoda to start their day. So there, there you are. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about Baby Yoda today. I'm actually here to talk about the Jedi Academy. And um, this is a program that is near and dear to my heart. This is our um, entry level program, uh, a global program for internships, apprenticeships, and graduate opportunities within Industrial Light and Magic. Um, as I think many of you know, ILM is global. We have studios around the world. Uh, and uh, most recently, we've launched a studio in uh, Sydney, Australia, where we've got tons of new opportunities coming up. And the Jedi Academy truly is a global program. It's, um, you know, working in visual effects, it's a super fast paced dynamic production environment. Things are changing all the time. And one of the things that I really love about the Jedi Academy is it is also dynamic. So different opportunities appear in different studios depending on uh, what we're working on and what our needs are. So um, that it, that's something that, uh, you know, being global and being dynamic is really important to us. I would say the other piece that's really, really important and it's kind of um, following up on what uh, Ryan was talking about is diversity and inclusion. And we really look at this program as an opportunity to bring in diverse talent and the next generation of talent into our industry. So what do we look for? Um, I, I'll, I'll hop through this pretty quickly, and this is actually included in a recruitment guide that is available online. So um, if you want to take notes, please do, but otherwise you'll, I'll, I'll send you a copy of this. Uh, so you'll have access to it. But obviously, you know, initially when we're looking at uh, who we're going to bring into the Jedi Academy, of course, we're looking at your portfolio. So, um, at, you know, if you're looking for an artist position where the assumption is that you've got some kind of online online portfolio and um, specifically for your portfolio or your reel, one thing that we always want to see is your best work first. So whatever you're most proud of, the thing that you really, really did, uh, that you really, really love, put that up front. We want you to, to kind of start with your best work first. And um, one other thing I'd say that's really helpful for a portfolio or or your reel is a shot breakdown. We want to know exactly how you contributed. We all, we all know that visual effects is an incredibly collaborative um, uh, process. And so, you know, you might be showing a shot, but we'd like to know exactly how you contributed to the creation of that imagery. Next up, experience. Um, I got to say, I was so happy to hear Giuseppe talk about the importance of the fundamental skills and the practical skills, like in addition, of course, to having your reel and having um, experience with um, the tool sets that, that we use, Katana, New, Kamari. Um, we also really like to see that you have some uh, foundational skills. And that means, um, you know, having some practical experience. So that means if you worked on an independent film, if you worked on set, um, if you did your own personal project, all of that work we want you to include um, in because uh, that really tells the story of who you are and the experience that you've had. Next up, in terms of in industry involvement, this is all about getting involved with, um, uh, you know, what what's going on within the industry. It's it's doing things like attending this talk. It's going to conferences like FMX or Seagraph. Um, and it's also, uh, you can become a member of a lot of great organizations. Access VFX is one I know uh, that's doing fabulous work and it's, you know, get, get uh, involved or connected with that community. But also there's something called the Visual Effects Society, as well as Women in Animation. I know in the UK, we have Animated Women UK. So there's lots of, there are a lot of great um, support networks and, and communities out there that you can start to tap into. Um, in terms of uh, next around industry knowledge, this is really just being familiar with what's going on in the visual effects industry. I mentioned that it's super dynamic, fast paced. Um, I think Giuseppe even had a, an image around, you know, using real time um, 
engines in, and on, on set and you know things were changing all the time. So stay on top of what's happening within the industry. That will serve you well. Um, Next up, just the thinking about enthusiasm uh, for the work and the industry. Uh, you know, especially with visual effects, I think it's really interesting because sometimes students aren't necessarily sure, do I wanna go into animation? Do I wanna go into visual effects? And I think, you know, for us at ILM, we wanna know that, you're, that you wanna be in visual effects. And we're looking for some pretty specific things like um, uh, photorealistic imagery, which might be different if you were applying to an animation studio. So if you're focusing on VFX, make that clear and make that known. Um, in your work. Then, uh, you know, in terms of knowledge and interest in ILM, so, you know, this, this really can extend to any of the studios that you might be applying to, but do your research, do your homework. There's tons of information out there online. I know ILM in particular has like a YouTube channel, which has tons of behind the scenes information, and you can just learn a lot about the company, and we always want people um, to do their homework, do their research before they apply. Finally, these last two, um, communication skills and being a team player. So I think um, Mark touched on earlier this idea of really emphasizing the soft skills. And, you know, we know working in this uh, in this industry, it is all about collaboration, right? It's all about working together. It would be impossible. I mean, you guys have all seen those credits, right? Like, you know, the, the thousands of names that run um, after an Avengers movie, like all those people are contributing to, um, to, to, to the, you know, the final results of the, of the film. But that requires a significant amount of collaboration. So that's a really key piece for us. Um, and that also means communication skills. And something for us that's really fundamental is giving and receiving feedback. You know, if you're an artist, you're going to be in dailies almost every day, getting receiving feedback from, uh, from a supervisor or a visual effects soup. And um, you might also need to turn around and give feedback to someone. So getting really comfortable with that skill of giving and receiving feedback, that's something that's really important to us too. Um, and finally, again, I would just want to emphasize, um, you know, right now in this moment we're experiencing, particularly in the States, but I think it's, you know, it's really a global movement around diversity and inclusion and really being mindful of what it means to be, um, to behave inclusively and to be part of, uh, part of an inclusive team. That's something else we really look for. So how do I apply? So we have a website, there's a lucasfilm.com careers, there's also an ILM specific job site. And um, you know, there's the, this is the kind of basic information that we look for, for in your application. And I wanted to touch on visa and work permits. I know that's something that um, obviously we're a global industry and I know we're talking to people that are all over the world right now. And so this is definitely a question that people have. So I will say um, the, the visa and work permit process really does differ um, according to whatever location you're in. Um, but one thing that does is consistent is getting a degree. So um, having a degree or a qualification in a re related field, those things are really, really vital. So as we like to say, work hard and graduate, stay in school, um, get that degree because that will really serve you well. Um, and then, uh, you know, in addition, uh, any kind of external recognition for your work, that's also always helpful if there's, an, a, you know, a student award that you won or a, a special project or maybe a publication, any, any kind of, um, uh, external recognition is also really helpful when it comes to thinking about uh, global mobility and and um, and work permits and visas. And then finally, any kind of professional industry experience you have will serve you well. A bunch of the information that I mentioned today is available off our website. So I don't know if you can see that. There's a little uh, if you there's a home uh, link, and if you there's a little drop down, and it says recruitment guide. So I recommend you checking that out. You'll get a lot of great information there, um, more detailed information than I shared today about about what it means to apply to a role at Lucasfilm or ILM. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Danielle, thank you so much. And I couldn't agree more with um, the industry, the industry knowledge and, um, you know, it, it, attending or participating and now we can all do it virtually. So there's no excuse for uh, all any of us to miss any any of these virtual events other than too many virtual events. But um, there's so much out there. I mean, there's a VES conference on Ray Harryhausen that they're doing, which is amazing. I and mean, he's a, a giant who helped set the stage for what we're all doing today. Um, 
and there's just so much out there. And again, this ver this opportunity for your students out there, for yourselves or your colleagues, there's so much um, available. So we're going to open up the call for Q and A. We're going to go 15 minutes with questions. Um, before that, just in case anyone has to go, um, I did want to share our winner of our FX PhD um, subscription, and hopefully you'll be able to tell us how you like the Victor Perez um, training on uh, photoreal compositing. So da da da. The winner is, oops, keep hitting my arrow, Nicolas Noël Jodouin from Centre Mad, Montreal. This has nothing to do with the fact that I'm from Montreal. I had nothing to do with choosing the winner. Um, it was randomly a random selection of winner. Uh, the winner was chosen for random selection. So Nicolas, um, we'll reach out to you. Hopefully you're still on the call and um, we'll set you up with your training from FX PhD. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to open this up for um, q and I'm going to, so speakers can turn on their cameras, if that's all right. Um, and I have a couple of questions here that I wanted to, um, there was one specifically I wanted to call out uh, from a gentleman named Luciano. Um, he was asking, can, how, how can we engage more students? So I, it looks like he's trying to build a course on courseware and school, um, and he'd love to know a little bit more on engaging students. Um, so that's how I read the question. Uh, hopefully that's what you meant, Luciano. Um, so I'm gonna turn that over to some of our educators here on engaging your students. Now that you have the advice from Danielle, how do you engage those students on some of those um, important can I, uh, can I pick that one up? That's okay. That's okay. Go Sorry. For it, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do a fair bit of outreach as well as um, teaching in the university. So I, I tend to go way back and actually uh, going back to ILM. I've been talking to Amy Blackwell in ILM. Big shout out to Amy. Uh, and we're trying to do um, presentations in primary and secondary schools. So what's that in, in uh, uh, Canada? So that's up to the age of 16 so from about 9 to 16 um because in england there's there's a there's a, a lack of drive in the creative sectors and schools so i'm trying to pull that back again and, and try and encourage the idea of this physics this science this maths you don't have to be an accountant with these things you can go into the creative industries um so i i went to a secondary school just before covid actually and demonstrated new can talked about the, the pre-malts, unmalts, uh, what a blend does and the max behind it to make an image. Um, and I think that that's some of the pull where kids can think maths is really, really boring. Uh, and then they can see they can do these really, really cool things with it. And where else can you go with it? Um, I don't know if anyone else has got any comments as well. But yeah, I, I think it's getting at them at an earlier age. Uh, and before... I hate to say it before the parents think they should become lawyers or doctors. <laughs> <laughs> no, I absolutely agree with you, Mark. You know, um, and I think that's uh, one of the reasons why I built that pipeline pedagogy. I think if you give students the onus on their education, um, so you kind of give them the controls and you're the guiding uh, party, if you will, they tend to learn more um, and, and be a lot better at what they're doing and their decision making and the importance of uh, each and every step along the way. Um, so, yeah, I think definitely if, if the students are put at the center rather than, you know, the teacher, always better. Yeah. And, I, and I'll just jump in and say that, you know, that's kind of the access VFX model, doing things for younger and younger trainees or students um, that might be interested in, in a potential career in VFX and, and kind of connecting the work that they're doing in their classrooms and, and maybe even, you know, downloading an app on their phone that allows them to map a, a mask to their face digitally or something like that. They can kind of instantly connect with. Um, and, you know, we're certainly trying to do that with high schools and middle school programs here in New York City and hope to do it a lot more so yeah yeah i'll chime in too i mean i think outreach for us i agree with what everyone's saying it's really vital and important and we you know we're looking at students that are 10 11 12 years old trying to engage you know even before they um become teenagers and just trying to get them excited about the industry and i think you know, our industry is actually so varied. There's so many different opportunities. And I think that's also part of our job is to um, describe all the different ways in which you can get involved in visual effects. Yes, I think that's actually really important because there's a lot of um, 
traditional, uh, I don't know how to say, you know what, I'm not going to go down this path. It's not going to end <laughs> the way I wanted to. <laughs> but yes, definitely educating on um, the fact that making video games and movies is a viable career choice. <laughs> it's, it's a good career choice. So um, I think that's super important. Um, there's a question specifically for, for Danielle. So I'm going to try this live answer. Did it show up? The question was, um, do you have to be a recent graduate to join the Jedi Academy? Um, um, that that's a great, Danielle. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Uh, it really depends. Like, you know, I was sort of speaking about how we have different opportunities in different studios, and the Jedi Academy is really our broader um, uh, umbrella for all of our entry level opportunities. So, yes, there are some programs that are specifically called out as a grad program, and we are looking for people that are recent graduates. There are other programs like our internship program. Th that's for folks that are still in in school, still enrolled in in university. So the idea would be they come to us for a short period of time and go back to school. Um, and then we have entry level opportunities. So maybe for folks that have had one to two years of experience, um, but are still pretty early in their career, there are opportunities uh, uh, for those um, folks as well. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I have a question that I have, actually. Um, how, as educators, how do you guys stay um, in the loop? How do you you know, with with all the work you have to do in, in, in teaching these minds of the future, how do you stay up to date with software, with industry, with techniques? Um, what's your what's your secret? Well, I, I tend to work most of the summer. <laughs> I, um, I, I, when I first started the degree, uh, obviously I couldn't fall back on what the students were feeding back to me. Um, so I fed on all my contacts of when I used to work in industry. Um, and now it's a combination of um, talking to you guys directly, like side effects, uh, foundry and so on. Um, talking to my graduates like Josh, who um, still <laughs> works there, and my contacts. But I, I think most of it's enthusiasm. Um, and it's d doing these kind of courses isn't like, I, I guess, a classical type of education where the same lectures are rolled out every year every year i think well what's new what should i change and quite often it's changing everything and starting again <laughs> but it's 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 not boring I, I, it'd be so so boring if i just rolled out the same lectures every year so i i think it's it's just just fun really uh, and i'm i'm lucky i live quite close to london so i quite often go to the, the big places like ilm and all the other places dneg have chats with the supervisors and interview the supervisors about what they think is up and coming and the demands of the next five years. And we, we try and plan that into our degrees. So excellent, excellent communication with the studios yeah. is important yeah. to you. Yeah, beers and burgers always help, uh, definitely, with that. Um, yeah, I think it's also future scope, and I think it all ties into uh, what we were just discussing before. We're doing this because we love it. You know, I, I started off wanting to be uh in vfx and i had a small studio and eventually i fell more in love with educating um but yeah it's um the future scope and if you're always one step ahead by speaking to all of the different studios and reading everything that's out there um you know then the training that you have to do uh, in terms of software or hardware etc is it's, it's not a chore it's a pleasure cool. lifelong learning I would love yeah. something to that. I think I think because like I work full time in production now, I only teach part time. So it's kind of the other way around, right? But um, the important thing is that uh, um, the the single disciplines of a visual effects productions are so complex. There are so many things for each specific sector that it would be really hard to be up to date with everything as an individual, right? So um, I always, uh, for example, when we teach our courses at Think Tank, uh, here in Vancouver, like we have people uh, that work in that specific field that teach only that specific model. So modelers or uh, compositors or um, in my case, like production and lighting and uh, cameras, that kind of things. So being being able to also access that kind of specialty uh, training, it's also very, very important, I think, um, to stay up to date with everything that is running. And I'll just chime in and say, I think that's true internally within a studio as well. Like, you know, things are changing all the time. We have uh, deep, deep, deep subject matter experts. And so even on my training team, uh, you know, my trainers are, are doing the same thing internally within the studio, staying connected to those folks that have the deepest expertise. And, and as we know, that expertise is also changing all the time. So, uh, yeah, but staying connected, I, I think, to the subject matter experts is really key.
definitely, I agree. Ryan, did you want to take a crack or do you want me to move on to the next well, one? I think everyone's kind of covered it, but I think, you know, we are the kind of people who enjoy getting involved in this stuff. We enjoy learning ourselves. Um, I've, you know, gotten a tremendous amount of gratification out of getting involved in other groups that are kind of extracurricular to my work and putting on different panels where we're reaching out to experts and allowing them to have a discussion in front of a group of people. And nowadays that's happening entirely remotely. So, you know, all of that is a way of sharing the information more broadly, but also getting the information for ourselves. And, and I find that, you know, that's been an incredibly gratifying part of my work. So, yeah. Amazing. Well, I, I really, I personally really hope that, you know, in the situation that we've been in, um, in 2020 <laughs> at home, um, and I hope there's more opportunities more than ever for people, um, like, like I mentioned earlier, with all the different conferences, um, SIGGRAPH is coming up. I actually would be remiss to miss to, to not talk about SIGGRAPH. Um, so we were on a call. Yeah, actually, we have a, a code for SIGGRAPH. If anybody wants to sign up for SIGGRAPH um, and get the free exhibit badge, you can use Foundry20 as your um, as your code. Elise will put it in the chat because otherwise I'll stop paying attention to what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, SIGGRAPH is going fully virtual this year. So you, know, you can attend um, all the different vendor booths for free. And then there's different pricing tiers if you want to do the online conference, um, I think the maximum is 350 before the 20th of July. Um, and actually, the, the coupon code <laughs> that uh, that Elise is going to put in the chat, or Emma will put in the chat, um, that actually gets you $50 off the other tiers of registration. Anyone in the world could use this. SIGGRAPH is free. So for the first time um, in my 15 years in this industry, we actually don't have to fly somewhere to be part of SIGGRAPH. And that's the amazing opportunity of being in this virtual environment that we've all been in um, for the last few months, many months. I don't even know what month it is. No kidding. <laughs> um, all right. So another question I had is um, I'd love to hear, like, would, what makes a student stand out to, to our educators and trainers on the call? Like, is there some special sauce that you like? You just know, like you know, you mentioned um, Mark. You had a few students who are now quite getting well known in the industry through their contribution to community. Mm -hmm. But can you see from a mile away when they start um, mm -hmm. if they've got that industry spark? I'd love to say yes, but actually, the, the the nice thing I guess is sometimes people don't find their feet the second year, um, and all of a sudden it switches, and you, you they just they just go for it. I, I think the, the light bulb moment for a lot of my students is when we do crits, and I, I try to emulate the dailies you get in, in big companies, um, rather than looking at it as something terrifying, all of a sudden they see it as, tell me everything that we could do to improve this, and we try and get the whole class involved. And it's, it's that point where they're, they're open to showing their work for crit, and they stop seeing it as criticism and see it as critique. And I think it's that it's that switch in maturity. All of a sudden, they just become sponges. And I, it, I think it, it it varies from person to person. Sometimes it's first year, sometimes in the second year, and sometimes it's the third year. But for me, you can see it in their eyes. And all of a sudden, they've got that burning desire in their eyes, and they just go for it. And it's what what's phenomenal. And um, we had a student. So I'm going to mention Ireland again because you're down here as well. But we had um, Zach Boxall who joined ILM quite a few years ago. Uh, he had a completely different way of doing texturing. And instead of using Mary, he was using Nuke for color balancing. Um, and he, he, he does look dev and all these other kinds of things. But he had such a passion, he just questioned everything. And I love that when students question what I do. And I think, oh, that's a really good point. And then it makes me go off on a whole tangent of research. Um, but the, it's it's that real sort of questioning mindset that I absolutely love. And then my students, yeah, I've got to say, because I know quite a few listening, but they're all great and I love them. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes you get a, a diamond in the rough. Uh, for example, that guy I was talking about earlier, Safe, when he came to EBAC, he's a, an international student from Tunisia, a uh, computer science degree already. So and he wants to do visual effects. So already you're like, OK, I know exactly what I'm going to do with you. I know exactly what tools I'm going to put in your hand. I know exactly how I'm going to coach you, move you over from what programming language you were doing before and introduce you to, you know, the new Lua script, for example, and all that kind of stuff. He's just mopping it up. It's just easy for him, this kind of thing. So sometimes you get students and it's, you know, as much as our job as theirs to kind of notice what 
they need and then to give it to them um you know and it's, it's amazing when you have these these uh these great students yeah, I'll, I'll second the diamond in the rough um, because we've had definitely had a few of those in our course. And, um, you know, I, I like to think that I can spot it by the language that they use to describe the work that they do. Um, but that's not always the case. But I find that, you know, if we do see a spark of something, if we go right after it, and we try to feed them some more information about how to build their skills and how to utilize and, and express themselves that you can see people just come out of their shell and really uh, run with it. So uh, I look for that every single cycle that we do uh, and we do them four, four times a year. So uh, it, those are always really, really exciting when we find those folks. I just chime in here too to say, um, I think we're always looking for folks that are really, really curious and um, are excited by um, hard problems, like challenging problem solving. And that, you know, that's something that isn't, it doesn't make them feel defeated, it energizes them. Um, and I would also say just being persistent, you know, like, uh, people might apply once and 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 uh, and not get a call or not uh, you know not be seen, but maybe a couple months later there's the right opportunity and they'll get a call. So I think um, you know being passionate and persistent are are really key um, things to focus on too. I'll chime um, in as well based on my experience. So I was lucky enough to know that I wanted to do visual effects since I was 13 years old. After Jurassic Park came out, right? That was my spark right there. Um, so I think there are two different kind of students. There are students that already know what they really want to do. And those are the ones that usually uh, try uh, to go straight to the goal. And then there are students that are fascinated by uh, this word, but it's such a complex word that sometimes you have to find what niche of that word you really like. So uh, we always encourage to have a first year where the students try a little bit of everything and uh, uh, know a little bit of everything and then maybe later on specialize because I've seen that uh, uh, in the second year sometimes that students oh I really like lighting I want to do lighting and I don't want I don't care about anything else or, um, or the same for other disciplines so you can definitely see uh, that the enthusiasm come uh, alive once the student finds that specific tool that he really likes to use like visually well, one one thing that I just wanted to add to is that I think uh, tied up in the diversity conversation is that I think all of us need to try to expand what we view as you know the the right model for a student to be interested in this industry because um, folks that we work with have never been given the opportunity a lot of times to learn these things, to work with these things. And, um, and I've seen time and time again, you know, when we do give them those opportunities or we are able to show someone that maybe comes from a similar background that they do or has overcome the challenges that they're currently going through themselves, that they're able to really open up and and bloom. Um, and so I think, you know, as an industry, I hope that everyone is going to continue to you know, look for different opportunities to support someone's growth and allow them an opportunity to build a career in this industry. Because I think that's the only way we get out of the rut of hiring the same people every single time. So. Uh, thank you for making that incredibly important point, because I think as as Danielle mentioned and, and as several of our speakers mentioned, um, diversity and inclusion is a really important topic um, globally for everybody. Um, and it's important to us at Foundry. Um, we're actually going to be hosting a panel on Tuesday, August 4th. Um, we haven't set up the the registration, but it'll be on our all of our, our pages I told you about. And we're working with a few creatives to talk about the black experience in VFX um, and looking towards the future and, and how we can we can help support that. So hopefully everyone um, will be able to attend that. We'll be sending that out in a couple of weeks or about a week with some interest, but we're looking at doing a lot more of these panels and also putting a spotlight in regions that we don't um, often get to focus on because there's amazing talent from all over the world. I mean, you know, I, I'm lucky I know Brazil's awesome in VFX, but I think there's probably some folks that don't realize that. And, and you know, putting, shining a light on Brazil is really great today because it's a really important and uh, emerging. It's, there's so much VFX talent. And of course, we have Jonas, who's in our chat, um, who helps support all the Nuke forums on Facebook. And Jonas is an awesome contributor to the Nuke community um, in Brazil and globally. 
I did want to thank everyone. Um, we're going to wrap up now because we're, we've got a little bit over time. Um, there's been some great questions. We didn't finish answering all of them. Um, but thank you to our speakers um, for putting the work and the time and the thought behind this. We really appreciate um, everything you shared. Uh, I, we'll have this, this recording will be available on Livestorm for the next few weeks. So if you want to share it, you can share the link that you, you signed up with today. Later, it will be on YouTube. Um, I highly recommend all educators to play Danielle's portion to all your students to talk about all the amazing things that ILM looks for. Um, great partner, Foundry, and uh, all of our customers um, you know, are, are, are great in supporting these education initiatives we've been doing as well. So thank you to our speakers. Um, thank you to our attendees. And uh, stay safe. Stay creative um, and have a great summer or winter, depending on where you are, actually. So I shouldn't just say summer, uh, <laughs> like Brazil. <laughs> so have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank have you. Bye.